Good evening. Good evening, everybody. This is uh, Professor Tennyson Mokuchini. Uh, welcome to uh, the first session on uh, your literature review. Uh, you will be aware that we have a, a two part delivery of the literature reviewing related aspects of your of your program. The idea is that the first part of uh, the first session will look at uh, much more lower level elements that are related to reviewing literature. We will speak also about uh, preliminary literature reviews and the like. And then the second, the second aspect, when we do the second part, we'll look at much more critical uh, literature reviewing and um, the different typologies, the different types of literature reviews that exist. Um, in simple terms, in simple terms, what we're going to be doing is uh, the first session will basically help you to understand what the components of literature reviewing are, and we'll also then speak to you about the type of literature review that we we would kind of expect you to have within a proposal, and that's typically referred to as a preliminary literature review. Uh, and once that's uh, done, that's kind of what the first uh, part is. Then tomorrow's session, which or the, the session we have next, I think it's, it's in a couple of days, uh, we'll have, um, a, we'll have a, a focus on much more specific activities that are related to literature reviewing and those activities are to do with um, things such as um, assessing the academic credibility of different sources that you look at, uh, some basic tips on argumentation, um, introduction to the different typologies and so forth. That is the type of skill you need for writing up a literature review if you were either completing your dissertation or completing your thesis. So essentially the two parts that we have are literature review in readiness for your proposal, then literature review in readiness for your dissertation or for your thesis. So those are the two kind of distinct uh, functionalities that we are trying to address in this session. Of course, um, this is pre-recorded because um, as you will be aware, uh, we've had some ongoing problems with load shedding and our commitment is that regardless of what the state of the environment around us is, we will make sure that we deliver something. But you can still uh, capture your questions on the chat and once you've done that, we will respond to them. As with all sessions, uh, the format is typically the same. I will turn off my camera in a second and turn on the presentation. The actual PowerPoint that you see in front of you will be available and will be emailed to every person that we've invited. But um, if for any reason you want to replay this recording, it becomes available to you uh, to access as and when you want to. Um, Right, so today, as I say, this session is explicitly on the first part of the literature review. And uh, I will share the screen in relation to that and uh, trust that you should be able to see it by now. Um, right, and I believe I've turned off my camera. Right, okay. Ladies and gents, um, the session, as I've said already, is part one of the literature reviewing section. We are going to be focusing on this for an hour and a bit. And once again, remember that this really um, sets the foundation for your understanding the much more complex expectations of literature reviewing. We will also focus on. Uh, we will also focus on how um, you can utilize the elements that are provided here in preparation for 
writing up the literature review section of your proposal. Of course, those of you who have completed the proposal, there are other elements of this that you will find worthwhile and useful. Uh, for those who might not already know me, uh, my name is Professor Tennyson Mokuchini. I'm facilitating today and um, I'm also the program um, the program leader. Actually, the program was uh, conceptualized and kind of the the primary parts related to it were written by me. So um, uh, I have, but as you know, I'm supported by a very, very capable team who will be providing some of the lectures that you are going to be exposed to in weeks to come. Now, as far as this session is concerned, we expect that you should be able to have a, a clear definition of what a literature review is and understand its importance. And once again, I will speak to you about the reason that it's important that we always depart with a definitional clarification of the, the phenomena or concept that we're looking at. I will share in very brief the different literature review typologies, the detail about how each one works will be something that I will cover a little bit later on uh, in the second session. Then, of course, I will speak to you about the expectations around how you search for primary, secondary and tertiary sources relating to your study. And that really means how you go about searching for literature that will support the study that you're doing. Uh, we will have a quick word, uh, some insights on how you you identify your parameters for your for your literature review, how there are certain things that are said and um, people have spoken about in relation to the expectations of a literature review. I will speak to those much more explicitly and kind of deal with some myths that have been um, circulated in and around research circles so that you just have an understanding that it's based on very clear and um, substantiated practices. Then uh, we will look at um, the use of relevance trees and other strategies that help you to, to build some structure around what your literature review will look like. Um, and that is what the first session will do. But remember, once again, folks, um, this is one session out of two. And uh, just to give you reassurance, the skill of literature reviewing is one that is almost a life learning journey. For many, you will find that uh, what you learn now and what you learn in your next session is very will be foundational and the more you review the better you get at it and the more reviews that you read the more you will identify how different people approach it because once you kind of get this repertoire of your insights into different literature reviewing um, formats you will then be best placed to actually become much more adept yourself at the whole process of reviewing literature. Now, these definitions of literature reviews, they vary from the very generic to those that are very specific. Uh, and one of the ones that kind of helps to just get you onto the same page that I am departing from is one that says that a literature review is a paper that summarizes and discusses what has been previously published on a topic. It explores the past research and its strengths and weaknesses. And this is a very generalized um, definition. It's got some components that are missing, but the key bits that it talks about is the idea of this summarization function of a literature review, this discussing function of a literature review, and this a function of assessing strengths and weaknesses of previous contributors. And those are key things 
that you need to hold on to as we proceed further on into this engagement around literature reviews. Um, of course, when you go to much more um, research specialized sources, you'll find that the definitions are much more littered with uh, more detail. And so firstly, you will notice that this definition by Fink and Fink has written quite a lot of work around methodology uh, in research and is um, kind of um, well thought of when it comes to to clarifying different typologies of, of um, reviews, also in kind of clarifying a lot of methodological issues. But Fink says that a literature review is a systematic, explicit and reproducible method for identifying, evaluating and synthesizing the existing body of completed and recorded work produced by researchers, scholars and practitioners. So now um, I want once again, I want to highlight to you the standout things. If you look at uh, this definition, it begins by differentiating a literature review from a research literature review. So remember what we are talking about when we speak in context of anything that I do on this program is very specialized to research. So we are talking about a research literature review. The minute you throw the word research in it, you realize that all the other components of what research is, and those components were the issues to do with research being systematic, research being logical, research being rigorous. So it becomes embedded in the definition of a literature review, and that definition is that literature review is systematic. So the way that you approach and deal with all the sources of literature that you're going to look at has to be formulated and informed by some type of system of processing information. The issue about it being explicit is that um, you don't leave anything uh, for people to assume you you clarify and you address everything that you believe needs to be addressed so you don't leave anything for guesswork you can't in a literature review do some review and then leave the others the other elements hoping that people can assume what is going to be said by you so you need to be explicit and then they talk about it being reproducible and the reproducible uh, element of literature reviews relates to the fact that every review that we carry out formally in research has to have enough detail given to the reader so that the reader may on their own decide to pursue the same topic that you pursued use the same search terms that you use, use the same search engines, and be in a position to identify and locate the same sources of literature that you would have located. So that reproducible um, aspect relates to the fact that the, the process by which you obtain literature can be reproduced by others who decide they want to follow in they want to follow in your steps now then they talk about the the issues of identification so in a literature review the steps that exist are that we need to teach you about systematic ways of identifying things we need to teach you about systematic ways of evaluating. And evaluation, if you remember, is to do with the summative assessment of something. So, so when you evaluate a paper, ultimately, apart from reporting what the paper did and what was said or happened as part of the paper, you have to reach an evaluative statement about the value add 
that this scholarly contribution brings to your understanding of the chosen topic. And then, of course, a literature review has this synthesizing function by the fact that it brings together many different scholarly pieces from different spaces to try and speak to your chosen topic. So there may be 40 studies that were carried out independent of each other. And what a literature review does is it brings them together and you get an opportunity to assess, analyze, identify, evaluate those in one singular space. Then, of course, there are some more salient but important aspects of what a literature review are. The fact that it is about existing bodies of completed works. So you can't take, you can't include in your literature review work that's currently in production as the basis for your evidence. And then of course the work has to be recorded and recorded means that this work has to be published at some level. And the spaces where publications happen is we have formal peer reviewed publications that are out there. Then people talk about gray literature, which is often, um, completed theses and dissertations that people have, but this, these outputs would have not been uh, formally published. So, so this gives you a sense about what a literature review is, what it intends to do, um, the methods that are pursued within it, and of course the types of work that a literature review should be interested in and it also tells you about the fact that these types of work would have originated from the works of researchers, scholars and practitioners. Now, uh, the other learning outcomes that are expected out of this is that we will ensure that you become much more competent at the evaluation of literature. And when I say evaluation, I'm saying being able to make a summative opinion about the relevance of the work that you're looking at, its value and its sufficiency. Um, and then, of course, in all of this, there's an expectation that we're going to apply critical perspectives. So you will not just read things for what it is and comment blandly you will actually be looking at critical positions, uh, points of argumentation, and uh, being able to critique things in an informed way. And along with this, we'll speak about the art of developing and defending your own arguments. Of course, when things are taught for you, taught to you for an hour, an hour and a half, all you tend to do is to get a sense of what the expectations are, but the actual skill of practicing as per expectation is something that will come with practice, will come with time. So uh, on that same story about what literature reviews are, there's additional voices that talk about, uh, that clarify and confirm that literature review is really about being comprehensive giving an up-to-date overview of public information on a subject area. Also, they give an account of credible published research on the topic, and then they give a critical look at significant and relevant, relevant existing literature. So remember there is the whole way in which you will identify what matters and doesn't matter to your topic and the literature review allows you to give a critical overview of what is going on, the key arguments, the key debates, the key positions and so forth. And what a literature review isn't is that it is not a list of all material published or just a descriptive summary of each piece. So if you write a literature review and you find yourself describing that this paper said this, this paper said that, without a critical engagement to assess the contribution of that paper, to critique the methodologies, to critique elements of, of the write-up, you must then realize that you're not behaving, 
as per expectation for a literature review. As I have already alluded to, there are two types of literature reviews or spaces in which we are expected to review literature. The first point at which we review literature is when you have a, an inkling or you have a hint in your mind that a particular uh, topic is worthy of exploration, you take that inclination and you take that clue, that feeling, that gut feeling that this topic is is indeed a question or a problem that needs to be explored. You take that and then you you look around for sources and papers that you can read to help refine research ideas. So you may know that, look, I believe that there's a problem in this subject area. And then, but you don't know exactly what the exact way of framing the problem would be, the exact way of presenting questions in relation to that identified area are. If you don't know those things, then the first thing you do is what they call a preliminary search or a preliminary review. And a preliminary review is exactly about finding a way for you to confirm that your your identified area of interest is indeed something that's substantiated by the literature. So you may find that uh, in any one study, people will do four or five different preliminary reviews. And that's because maybe the first review that they do will show them that the topic that they thought was worthy of investigation is not worthy of investigation because it has been attended to and the questions that they thought had not been answered have been answered. They just were not aware of the publications that do this. The other outcome that is likely from a preliminary review of literature is that you will get confirmation that yes, the general topic that you've identified is indeed a problematic area, but the preliminary review will allow you to specifically identify the unique and explicit questions that exist in relation to that topic. So take, for example, if we were looking at the success of students who study master's and doctoral work, you may do a preliminary research or preliminary review, which will confirm that indeed the success of students is a problem. But in your preliminary review, you will arrive at literature that will help you to frame out what the exact nature of the problem that exists is. So maybe the type of problem that would exist is that you'd say, look, student success has been confirmed to be a problem, but what the more specific challenge is that we don't know what the factors that contribute to someone failing or dropping out are. So that is all, that is what a preliminary review will allow you to, to do. But once, and that is, a, that is in essence a type of review, and that is the type of review that we will broadly be focusing on, on the session, in the session today. Then the second space in which you find yourself reviewing is the space where you do what more, what's considered a critical literature review or some might call it the literature review proper, as in the proper literature review. This is the part of the review where you have identified the topic you want, you've identified the questions you want, you are now looking at the literature that has been presented in relation to those questions to actually better understand the contests that are in play, the arguments that exist, the research uh, that supports or contradicts a particular position that you might be aware of, the areas of agreement or the areas of disagreement between literature as it relates to a topic. So you will notice that the first the preliminary review is about justifying and giving rationale for why you have chosen the topic you have chosen. 
Then the second type of literature review relates to you actually critiquing the different scholars, the different researchers, and the different professional contributions that exist in relation to your identifying topics so you can figure out what it is that's going on, where the arguments are, where we know what the answers are, where there are existing gaps of knowledge. So that relates to the critical literature review or what people would call the literature review proper. Now, with all um, literature reviews, they have basic characteristics, and I'm going to share some of them for you. Uh, already, if you have had a, a look and kind of internalized the different um, definitions that were offered earlier on, you will find that these characteristics I'm sharing with you are not, in essence, anything brand new. They are just an extension of what the uh, definitions already had. But you will know that uh, effective literature reviews outline important research trends. So remember, you're looking at all literature that has been done in relation to a topic. So when you bring it all together, that's your opportunity to say, hey, look at the trend in the way that this topic is understood. So things like mixed methods research was a product of people doing literature reviews where they would look at qualitative studies and look at quantitative studies and they'd always discover that these studies were never pure. They always had a little bit of quality in a quantitative study and they also had a little bit of quantitative in a qualitative study. So that gave the basis for understanding the important research trends that were going on. And similarly, when you do a literature review and it's done effectively, you will notice that it, it spells out the different research trends that exist. Okay, the next thing that an effective literature review does is that it's effective in assessing or bringing out the strengths and weaknesses of existing research either in terms of showing the strengths and weaknesses of different papers or different contributions, but you can, it also gives you a much more global authority to talk about the strengths and weaknesses of a total body of research as it relates to a topic. So, and this is where people will come back with conclusions that sound something like this. You may find that a person will say, hey, it seems like all the research that has been done is Western research and none of it is from um, the, the, the uh, non-Western countries. That becomes your global position about the overall strengths and weaknesses of the research in a specific field. Also, when you join up everything that is, has been published in relation to a particular question, it gives you an opportunity to identify the questions that have not yet been answered. In other words, the potential gaps in knowledge that exist in relation to a specified topic. Then, of course, when you identify those gaps, that becomes a motivating um, factor for you, indicating what areas need to be studied further and so forth. So effective literature reviews give you an opportunity to establish a need for current and or future research projects. And then, of course, once you have done all this and you can show the important trends, you can show the limitations, you can show what it is that is needed to going forward, you then have that golden recipe for building a full justification of the focus area that you would have chosen. Now, of course, now that we have an understanding about the literature review and what its purposes are and the different ways in which it functions and adds to our wealth of understanding of topics, the first thing that we have to now get to the bottom of is 
giving you some insights on how you find literature, the places where you are officially um, kind of supported to look for literature. And these next few slides are literally just there for information. It is to provide you with the, uh, uh, a guide for your actions as you work on this. And of course, the, they are quite straightforward, but it's necessary that we do this so that you have the full understanding of the literature reviewing process from its very, very uh, initial point of departure. So if you are able, or if when you look for literature, there are some well-acknowledged and accepted access points that traditionally people would find literature from hard copies in libraries and those types of things, you know, the reference materials and books, journals, great publications. And when we talk about great literature, we are talking about these completed masters and doctoral theses that um, we know have been carried out through vigorous research activity, but they are not yet formally published and have therefore not been subjected to explicit peer review. That is what we call grey literature. Then, of course, um, the official publications that we talk about are publications that may be uh, policy documents from governments and so forth and so forth. But uh, with all of these things, we must accept that not all literature is born the same. And what I'm saying with that somewhat um, um, cross-worded uh, statement is that we, there's an acknowledgement that different types of literature sources offer different qualities of literature in as far as research is interested. So you will see that as part of your process of reviewing literature, you also have to be able to assess the credibility of the source that you're looking at. And in doing that, there are specific methods that have to be used to assess credibility. And once again, once you've found that literature, it's use, it's use to you can be for all sorts of reasons, many of which have been described so far when I spoke about the definition. But in the literature you find could be to help you focus your interest a bit more. So you read and you, find, you get a finer sense of what's really going on in a field. It helps you to better specify what question that you're interested in is. So the more you read about a topic, the better you understand the different terms that are being used and so forth and so forth. Then the next thing is if you have um, a position that you hold in relation to a particular uh, issue or you, you, you have um, argued for the fact that something is worthy of study, literature will help you to argue that rationale and that position. Then, of course, um, there is within research, there is nothing that you can do without having effective support structures for your position, having a theory, theoretical basis or evidential or empirical basis informing the direction that you take. So literature will help you to to theoretically inform the direction that your study will take. And of course, once you have that literature, it will help you to develop, to identify the appropriate design for your study. It also helps you in developing that content that you need for the literature review proper, uh, as in the critical literature review that I spoke about. Now, what I've done is um, um, this idea of just mapping out what the literature review process 
process is. It is an iterative process, and basically what we mean by that is that it's um, um, it's ongoing, it's repetitive, but it's progressive at the same time. So there are certain things that you keep doing as you become better at the review process, but uh, when the more you find out, the more you must go back to those things to do them. So for example, um, you may be someone who starts off by by um, uh, saying that, look, uh, you are interested, you have particular research questions and things that you want to understand. The literature will help you to define the parameters. So when you read up on on this thing, and, and if you work from the left of your screen that you're looking at, you will see that you've got research questions and objectives, and that when you engage with literature, it helps you to define much more clearly where your interests start and where it ends. So you define and, and um, can define your parameters of interest. And once you have got that, you are in a position to generate and refine the keywords that you're going to now use to search for for this data that you're interested in or literature. And once you've got that, you're in a position to conduct reach the search. Um, and when you conduct the search, it will give you hits or give you results. And from that, that you can obtain the literature, which you are then in a position to evaluate and record. And then you start drafting as you as you do that, you engage with that and you begin to draft and refine um, the review and so forth. And if you look at this, you will find that that cycle, the initial cycle of generate and refine keywords, conduct search, obtain literature, review and record, it replays itself over and over again until you have the output of this complete literature review that you are seeking to get. But the iteration that we speak about really relates to this repetitive uh, process in which you search, conduct search, you obtain literature, you evaluate, you record, and you generate and refine the keywords, and then you proceed on with a much more refined understanding to do the exact same thing. Now, um, when you read a paper, and this is where now the active skills of practicing the art of literature review come into play. When you read a paper, apart from just reading it so you have basic knowledge about the topic, there's an expectation that you are reading and you're reading this with very specific practices and behaviors that will help you to have a much more critical understanding of the questions that exist in relation to a topic, the issues that remain unanswered, and of course, the gaps of knowledge that you want to pursue. As you do this, there are a number of frameworks that are used by people to, to assess and read, or in other words, appraise the type of uh, the literature that they have in front of them. And the sort of things when you're summarizing sources before you're able to write up on these sources, you ask questions like, who is the author? What is the purpose of that paper or that uh, source that you're looking at? What is the theoretical perspective that drove them or indeed the research methodologies that they used? And you, when you, I say what is, I'm asking you to ask what the particular item is, but in addition to that, you are expected then to do the critiquing of the evidence that exists in relation to that element and doing some type of evaluative engagement with the literature. So you ask who is the intended audience of the, the item that you're reviewing, what is the principal point that is being made by this, what is the 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 ultimate uh, focus of the researcher or the author because in that there's a principal point 
they they will draw conclusions in relation to what it is that they were exploring they offer a thesis or a position about what it is that they understand to be going on and of course if there are things that they disagree with they offer contentions and or questions about how the world should progress further. Uh, and then you also look at the work to ask questions like, how is this position or the claims that are made by the author supported? And how does this study relate to other studies that have looked at the same problem or topic? Does it agree with them? Does it disagree? Does it add to them? Does it take away from them? Um, how seminal is it in relation to the others and so forth? And then, of course, each paper that you read is ultimately intended to be a source of information or to have some relevance to what you are intending to study. So it is important at some point when you look at the work to ask and clarify this question about what the study you're looking at proposes to add to the study that you have uh, you have planned for yourself. So how does the study that I'm reviewing add to my project that I'm intending to work on? Now, I did say that I, I will talk to you about the typologies of literature reviews in tomorrow's, uh, or in the next session, whether it be tomorrow in two days time or so forth. I'm mentioning them here so that you, ex you understand that there are different types of literature reviews, but I want you to understand this just for the purposes of knowing that there are different types, but not so that I teach you in depth about the different types quite yet. That will be something that we'll focus on when we come to the second session. Now, there are over 37 published types of literature reviews, so clearly I cannot share all those with you. But in master's and doctoral work, there's maybe five or six that are often um, often identified within these types of work. So the first is a narrative literature review, and that really is about, it's a kind of uh, the most traditional type of literature review. Some people talk about it as being a thematic uh, uh, literature review. So basically, you look at different themes that are argued upon in relation to a particular question, and then your literature review will follow that structure. So it will go from one theme to the next. So if say you were doing a literature review on the contributors to non-success um, among students, I would say, look, the literature says that there are three themes that should be pursued. The first theme is that students fail by virtue of being um, <clears throat> poorly prepared for the work that's ahead of them. So that theme, you would then look at all the papers that look at student characteristics and how they contribute to failure. Then you might have another theme that says uh, people's success is to do with systemic problems in the institutions where they study. And then if that is indeed the second theme, you would have papers under that theme and you engage with them in that way and so forth. So that is a narrative uh, literature review. Then they talk about systemic reviews, and these are, uh, sorry, systematic uh, reviews, and these uh, fall into a number of different groups. And those different groups are to do with, with um, the type of way in which uh, groups of papers are brought together to be reviewed. So sometimes, like in a quantitative systematic review, people will bring back together only studies that explore a particular topic using quantitative methodologies. So if the study that you had was a quantitatively based study, then we would make that or include it in the review. Um, they, I've mentioned the meta-analysis, deductive and meta-synthesis inductive and I will speak more in detail about those but uh, they're kind of some of the hybrids that exist in relation to system 
systematic types of review formats. Then uh, the other type is something that they call the argumentative literature review. And this basically refers to a literature review in which you review literature, but you group the literature according to the different arguments that it seems to speak to. So you may have one source of literature that says, look, the argument is students, students do badly because they are taught badly. So that is an argumentation position, and you would look at literature that supports that argument, and then the next paragraph or next page will have another argument, and you would look at and review papers that speak to that position in relation to the argument. So if your literature review is structured along the different arguments that exist, then it is much more likely to be an argumentative uh, literature review. There are other there are other literature review where people will say there's a critical critical literature review approach, or they talk about um, um, chronological literature review and so forth. And those are all the types that I will introduce to you in much greater depth when we do the second session. But what I wanted to do and demonstrate with you by mentioning the different types of literature review is to actually say that, look, when you are reviewing literature, you have the option of being a different style depending on uh, the, the type of the type of literature review that you have opted for. So if you opt for something that's uh, argumentative, then the style of your literature review will speak that way. If you look for something that's uh, uh, um, chronological, for example, you will discover that there are literature reviews, but there are literature review literature reviews that can be presented as chronology as chronological things, but um, they can only be done so if a topic presents itself in a time series. And what I mean by that, without confusing you uh, unavoidably, is to say that there are some subjects that can be reviewed and the review will take the format of talking about literature from 1980 then literature from 1983, literature from 1985, in a chronological way. And if you present your literature review exclusively by just citing all the papers that were done early and then the ones that came later and later until the most recent ones, then that becomes a chronological type of review. But once again, I've just mentioned this type so you know that there are different types and the different types speak to the different ways in which individuals act as reviewers in their work. So someone will act as a person who is presenting different arguments, someone will act as a person who's di presenting different themes, or others will act as a, as a person who is presenting um, the varying um, papers according to the time period during which each paper was was made available. So now, in the other function, the other thing that we speak about within literature reviews is this whole expectation of the summary and synthesis function. And that summary and synthesis function has to do with uh, with bringing out what the key arguments that are being presented by the different sources that you look at are, and what the key characteristics of all the contributors are, what are the key concepts what they, that they bring, what are they, who are the key figures in relation to this topic. So there's always an understanding that each subject will have people who are almost subject gods that you cannot write about change management and not include the work of Lewin, for example. You cannot write about motivation and not include the work of Maslow, for example. You cannot re, uh, 
write about educational objectives and not mention the word of bloom. So you need to understand in your study area who those key opinion leaders, leaders are and who the key figures in relation to the topic area are because they must be included at some point in your summarization of the topic. I've spoken about the existing debates and the theories. I've spoken also about the fact that when you do a literature review and you're reviewing particular papers, you have an opportunity to assess the methodologies that were used by each of the contributing authors so that you can critique those methodologies in terms of how valid they are, how credible they are, what they bring and offer in terms of your understanding of a topic. Now, um, the other thing that I referred to in relation to, to the function of a literature review is that apart from summarizing the evidence, there is an opportunity for the literature review to serve as a way of comparing the evidence and also critiquing it as you compare it. So you evaluate strengths and weaknesses of the work that's in front of you, how the different studies relate to each other, what is new that is offered by each study, what is different, what is controversial, uh, what views have been expressed that need to be tested further, where is the evidence lacking? What are the inconclusive things that people have shown? Because that comparison and critique becomes the bit of your review that becomes, that is engaging, that's uh, explicitly critical, that allows for you to offer your own positions about what you think is going on. So it is, it's, it, it's, it, it's you departing from just describing things. Then, of course, once you have summarized things and you have a sense of what is being said by so and so, you have a chance now to put forward the different positions and points of view that are being put together and to synthesize and, and put this together so you can say paper A says move left, paper B says move right, paper C says move this way. In summation, when I put put everything together, this is the position that I think is most prudent to adopt in relation to the topic that I'm exploring. Now, there are some key questions that you put, you need to have when you're, you're kind of working on a literature review. It's uh, the key questions are what do the researchers know and agree about in relation to the topic you've written? What do researchers and others not know or have limited agreement about? What should we study again going further? And what will the proposed study that you have contribute to this area that you've looked at? In particular, how does it contribute to the area of the things that are not known as we speak? Now, Remember, I said we looked at um, a definition of what a literature review was. And once again, that definition is captured when one looks at the, an, at the tasks of a literature review. That a literature review has four functions that we speak about. And when you're reviewing literature, if you can make sure that at a basic level, what you're doing is offering some summarization of the different papers and the different contributions that are there, you can offer some syn synthesis as in joining up of the different arguments so that you can come up with a newly revised and widely informed position. Then you need to offer some critique. What is it that's weak with the current evidence? What is it that's strong? What needs to change going forward and so forth and so forth. Then, of course, you do a comparison that looks at comparing the different um literatures, for lack of a better word, the different positions that are explained or shared by the, the literature sources that you have looked at. So when you are writing up a literature, you realize that you have four functions you need to somehow capture. 
the summary function, the synthesis function, the critical function, and the comparison function. Now, okay, um, Jankovic, uh, who is a, 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 a very well respected contributor to to the world of 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 critiquing things argues that um the purpose of a literature review is to show your critical awareness of um uh the research area and the current BOC. BOC is body of knowledge so you you should sh show authoritatively that when someone reads your work they can tell that you really really do understand the topic that it's hand and you do so very clearly um, um then the next thing that um you should the other thing that a, a critical review can do is it assists you once again to refine questions and the objectives, the things that you're interested in. It allows you to explore uncharted research possibilities. Hmm. It allows you to explore uncharted research possibilities and to discover uh, or to use the literature in front of you to look at the different new approaches and strategies and techniques that exist in relation to your chosen topic. Of course, what you also have to do and think about is answer the question around whether your study is filling a knowledge gap that's been agreed upon as being something that is needed. So this session builds together all the different positions about what a literature review is. And in doing so, I hope that I've I'm beginning to paint a picture about what the function of a literature review is. The structure of how one looks like is a little bit more difficult to coach you in the way that I'm coaching now. But if you understand what the, the different activities of literature reviewing are, you will be able to then merge it with the structure that you see. And what I often ask people and advise them to do is that, look, if you're doing a literature review for a, a course where there's predecessor work, there are other literature reviews that have been done. There are other preliminary reviews that have been done. There are other um, uh, examples to look at. Go, go take them find the, the examples and get a sense of what it is that's going on. So, but the process of carrying out a literature review or the process of being critical in your literature review is can be split up into two distinct ways of approaching it. And those two distinctive ways are split between, between what is called the deductive approach and the inductive approach. These are much more complicated. These are much more complicated. Um, uh, these are much more complicated um, um, concepts, which I'm introducing now just for the sake of you understanding. Understanding how when you write a, re a literature review, there are essentially two ways from which you can be approaching a subject. The first way is that you can um, find different literature on on related topics, and when that when you read and review that literature, you start to to develop um, a theoretical position about what you think is going on. And then once you've got that position about what you think is going on, you can test what you found by looking at the data that's available also that data will be from um uh that data will be from from literature or or that data will be from you collecting it imperatively that is essentially what a deductive approach is and a deductive approach is so the beginning of the literature review would begin with a theoretical 
um, a statement that says, look, I believe X is a factor that involves this. Then through you engaging with the theories that are out there, you're able to formulate a much more clearer statement about what you think is related to what and in what way. Then you could use the literature that you, you have in front of you as the data that you collect and analyze it. And then on the basis of that, you can accept or reject that initial statement that you put together as your hypothesis. So that's called the deductive approach to critical reviewing. Now, the more common approach, uh, the more common approach that you find within studies is more of an inductive approach, where actually you begin your, your review of work with, by observing what's going on. So you pull in the literature and you read it and you do all sorts of things, you extract patterns from it. And, and then from that, you develop tentative summations of what's going on, which are really tempered tentative hypothesis. Then from that you develop a theory or you make theoretical positions. And in many cases, that tentative hypothesis and the theory formulation bit can be things that people contain in a separate chapter from the literature review. So I've included uh, some questions here that are worth asking when you're gaining that critical perspective when you're making sure that the way you read and engage with work is critical and allows you to, to see things from the angles that would give you some critical material. So you ask yourself, why am I reading this publication? What is the author trying to communicate? What in this publication is relevant to what I am doing? How convincing is the author and the work in terms of the methods they use, in terms of the subject they focused on, and so forth. And how can I use what I've seen to further my understanding of the question that I'm interested in? And so what, um, when you are doing um, critical engagement with literature in a particular topic, uh, they, they say that uh, the first thing there are four aspects that you can look at when you're approaching critique, and those aspects relate to you critiquing the rhetoric. So you want to do an assessment of the language that is being used by people and, and understanding how different contributors speak and assert their positions. You can also be able to position your critique in such a way that you critique the traditions that have been accepted. So you, you present things so that you are able to question what people have accepted as uh, conventional wisdom within the, the topic area. Or a similar sort of things is the way you critique authorities. So you there will be names that are associated as or seen as being the leading authorities in a field. You can your critique can target them and actually ask questions of their positions, or you critique the objectivity of, of the work that's presented in front of you. So you ask questions about whether the methods that have been accepted before are indeed the best methods for what it is that you're, 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 you are focusing on. Now, when it comes to doing a critique of your study, when you're looking at a particular study and you're getting material about that study that will allow you to write in a critical way, one of the things you have to do is to have some questions that are typical questions that you can ask so you have the material upon which to write your critical piece, your critical commentary. Now, the first thing that is presented to you in any study that you look at is the abstract. So you can critique that. You can uh, critique the way that the study is described. Is you can critique whether it is indeed relevant to what you're interested in. Do the conclusions that appear to be asserted within the abstract look relevant to your area of interest or not? And of course, if you find that that abstract shows you that the work is not relevant to you, your critique of that paper stops at that point and you move on to the next paper because you've disqualified it. 
assuming that you have not disqualified it, the next place that you look at is a problem statement. Is it clear? What is the purpose of the problem statement? How have they shown how significant a problem it is that they are looking at? And have they shown how significant or important the likely contribution of their work is in understanding this problem area that you have chosen? Then, of course, um, depending on whether you have a qualitative or quantitative study in front of you, the next point of critique in a study is when you look at the hypothesis that's presented to you or the research questions. Are these clear? Are these relevant? Are they in any way related to your study? Are there any limitations with them? And then, of course, with each study, there are embedded assumptions that the authors of that study would have been driven by. So your question is to ask, are these assumptions explicit? Are they implicit? Are they similar to yours? Are there contradictions? Are the assumptions outdated? And so forth and so forth and so forth. And that becomes points where you can critique things. Then, of course, there's this um, issue around the scope of the study or what people talk about as the delimitations. And delimitations talk about the, the, the areas that were declared as the scope of what it is that you're reviewing. So if you review a study and that study only focused on 10-year-olds and 15-year-olds, then you have an opportunity to critique that delimitation, that scope. Was the study narrowed in a way that makes it less relevant to what you're in, interested in, or does that narrowing help you to see things much more explicitly? and so forth. Also, you can critique. Remember, these two slides give you the sections that you can critique. You can critique the definitions that are offered. You can critique the methods. Is the research design used appropriate? Were the samples sufficient? Are the populations that were identified as the primary sources of data appropriate? Were appropriate measurements were used? Were appropriate procedures used? Then the findings, are the findings sensible? Do they resonate with your area of interest? Do they appear logical? Do they appear to, to actually be in line with what it is that was found out? And what I mean is you may find that there are some findings where a person will do a study of two people in a population of 2,000 and then uh, make the studies, the findings sound so emph emphatic that it actually really um, looks like they're claiming things that are outside of their ability to claim. So those are the questions you ask. Then you can ask about the discussions. Was the discussion presented in, your, in the piece you're reviewing clear? Is there a clear interpretation? Do they relate their findings to the wider um, discourse of the phenomena that they are looking at and so forth? Then, so, so far, I've given you little points of where you can critique pieces of work, but also the types of questions that you, you ask. Now, um, one of the other key ways in which people do studies or do reviews is to do what is called cross comparison between studies and when you do this it's uh, you're going to review something but you review it by comparing it to other people so instead of reviewing it on its own and for its own purpose you review it primarily so you can through through you review it through assessing how it levels up against other studies in the field so that helps you to reveal the key points of the different things that are being studied. You can talk about the differences in the aims of each of the studies and the hypotheses that they pursued. You can compare the methodologies. Uh, you can talk about the research designs and the sampling they used, the instruments, procedures, the ways they analyze data and so forth and so forth. And basically what you do with the comparison is particularly useful when you have studies that are contradictory in the outcomes that they push for. So if you have a study that says that the best 
uh, the, that offers direction X. Then you have another study that offers a contradictory direction. Then what you do when you're comparing them is you now talk about their differences in their aims, differences in the methodologies and so forth. So this slide that you've got in front of you is a useful template that you use when you're comparing study A to study B. Then, of course, I have said we spoke about the definition of a literature review, including this word that it should be reproducible. And reproducible means that you should articulate it and describe it in such a way that someone who reads and accesses it after you is able to continue and do, is able to continue and do um, the work in pretty much the same way that you you did it. And one of the ways that people begin this process is by offering is by offering um, kind of diagrammatic uh, overviews of what they intend to do. So some of these diagrammatic overviews are um, include a feature map, a concept map or tree constructions. And all that this is, is that if say you were deciding to tell us what you were going to review or the different themes or the different arguments or the different points that your literature review would be looking at, you could present that as a concept map where you just show the different, you know, you draw a picture uh, of a tree or whatever, or just some concepts hanging, and you indicate that these are the 15 concepts I'm going to look at, and you indicate what those concepts are. And on the basis of that, when you write up your literature review, you follow the literature review according to one concept to the next. This, of course, will make much easier sense when we are focusing on it much later on, uh, when we do part two of this. Once again, there are ways of organizing the content. So you can uh, co organize the content in a number of ways. Some people will choose a singular approach. Some people will mix it all up. You can organize the content according to the different themes that you want to look at. So is there an issue that you want to focus on in each part of your literature review? And if that is the case, you look at issue one and all the literature around that. You look at issue two and all the literature around that. Look at issue three and so on. Or do you want to organize your work according to the chronology of the work that you're looking at? So the first section looks at all the studies from the 1980s. Sixth section, second section looks at all the past studies from the 2000s and so forth. But both these principles of organizing can be used independently or people can join them up in one literature review. So you have a little bit of thematic work. You have a little bit of chronology. Then, of course, there are other ways of organizing content, people will decide that I'm going to look at all the qualitative studies alone and I'll look at the quantitative studies alone. And that is a methodological uh, process towards organizing content. Uh, this latter option is very rarely used, but it can be used. And often people utilize it if there's evidence that the ways and the outcomes of, of different things have been affected significantly by virtue of the different methodologies that people use. Um, and then the next way of organizing things is that people sometimes do what they call the specific to general, where they uh, discuss, they look at very specific studies, but in order for them to make much more generic conclusions about what it is that's going on. So they might say um, uh, research has shown or a study by so-and-so has shown that people who do not succeed at school have low motivation. Then once you've identified that study, you can then say low motivation 
is identified as one of the factors that widely reported in such and such. So you referred to one study, but the outcomes of that study you have umbrellaed out to include other things. So you've 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 um, spread it out to allow you to draw conclusions about wider issues. And then, of course, some people will start with a specific example and go to general, or the other way you organize things is the exact opposite of that, where you make a generic statement and then you identify literary sources that can support that generic position. So you go from the general to the specific. All these are ways of just some tricks and understandings of the way that you're able to, to critique, you're able to develop and, and, and work on um, critiquing or organizing your critique or your review of papers. Now, folks, what um, we, we have um, reached the part of, of the presentation that goes on to the critical review. And remember when I said critical review, I spoke about the fact that this is the review where you, um, you have confirmed the topic you want, you have made the choices you want, you have, and so forth. You are now literally um, trying to review work so you can understand the contests that exist in relation to the topic and the questions you have chosen. And this part, the critical review, is what we are deferring to, to tomorrow's session. We're deferring this to the next session, whether that is to tomorrow or not. Uh, does is not specific, but part two of the literature review presentation focuses now on the presentation of the critical review. So I will stop here in relation to the work that has been presented so far that I've introduced you to what literature reviews are. I've let you have a taste of the different types of them. I've had you have a taste of the different um, of the, the the different considerations that occur within a literature review, and the different approaches that exist in terms of organizing the literature, the ways in which you identify potential literature and so forth. So that's the first session, and uh, to you as the listeners of this session. The literature review teachings tend to tell you all the things that should happen and somehow they don't quite gel together until you get a chance to see a living literature review. So as we proceed on, there are sessions where we'll show you examples of what a literature review looks like, give you an example of what um, uh, a preliminary review looks like. And so all these things that we have taught you now can come together into a visual summation of what it is that's going on. So uh, without going too far into uh, the rest of, without going too far into the rest of what should be covered tomorrow, I will uh, take us off. I will take us off the shared window and uh, once again indicate to you that uh, you have the option of posting your questions on the chat, but because this is part of a, a session that um, is a two-part session, you may want to wait it out a little bit until you've seen part two so you can present your questions then. Without uh, taking up more time, I want to thank you for attending part one of the literature review uh, presentation. Part two will follow and part two will speak much more about uh, the critical or, or review, the literature review proper. I thank you for that. Take care.